Black Girls Podcast, a weekly conversation about mental health, personal development, and all the small decisions we can make to become the best possible versions of ourselves. I'm your host, Dr. Joy Harden Bradford, a licensed psychologist in Atlanta, Georgia. For more information or to find a therapist in your area, visit our website at therapyforblackgirls.com. While I hope you love listening to and learning from the podcast, it is not meant to be a substitute for a relationship with a licensed mental health professional. Hey, y'all. Thanks so much for joining me for session 262 of the Therapy for Black Girls podcast. We'll get right into our conversation after a word from our sponsors. AT&T Dreamin' Black wants to celebrate you, the changemakers, innovators, and visionaries uplifting their communities. If that's you, you do not want to miss the chance to power even greater possibilities. Enter the AT&T Black Future Makers Contest for a chance to win $10,000 and an AT&T 5G-enabled device. You got this. Learn more at attdreaminblack.com slash contest. Must be 18 and older. Other restrictions apply. When my family and I travel for vacation, one of my favorite things to do is to visit the local Whole Foods market to stock up on snacks for our time there. I love visiting Whole Foods markets in new areas because the selection is always so unique. Have you ever noticed the difference between the goodies offered at each store? That's because they put a big emphasis on stocking things from local suppliers. It's another fun way to explore the area you're visiting. Looking for more ways to be well as you enjoy summer fun? Visit WFM.com slash wellness for more wellness tips. As the seasons change, your skincare and makeup routine might as well. If you're putting together your summer looks, Macy's has got you covered with online guides and tips to help you create a routine that's summer ready and sun safe. Perhaps you're looking for a new lightweight moisturizer or maybe even a new summer fragrance. They've got everything you need to build a routine that is catered to you. Discover even more ways to make your beauty shopping a breeze at Macy's.com slash beauty. In honor and celebration of Pride Month, today we're focusing on the experiences of those in the LGBTQIA community that identify as asexual or aromantic. This week, I'm joined by Yasmin Benoit the award-winning aromantic asexual activist and founder of the This Is What Asexual Looks Like movement. Our conversation explores what asexuality is and how it differs from aromanticism, some common misconceptions about the asexuality community, and the intersection of being both a Black woman and an ace aero woman. If something resonates with you while enjoying our conversation, please share with us on social media using the hashtag TBG in session or join us over in the sister circle to talk more in depth about the episode. You can join us at community.therapyforblackgirls.com. Here's our conversation. Thank you so much for joining us today, Yasmin. Thanks for having me. I'm very excited to chat with you. I would love for you to begin by just telling us a little bit about yourself and about how you identify on the spectrum. Well, my name is Yasmin Benoit. I'm a model, an aromantic, asexual activist, writer, speaker. And I just really just use the terms asexual and aromantic. I don't really get too deeply into the semantics. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And for those of us like with a very beginner's knowledge, can you give us a little bit of a like just a generic or simple definition of asexuality and how it's different from somebody who's aromantic? Yeah. So asexuality means experiencing little to no sexual attraction towards anyone, regardless of their gender. So it's a type of sexual orientation. Um, whereas being a romantic is a romantic orientation, and that means that you're not romantically attracted to anybody. So you can be asexual about being a romantic, and you can be a romantic about being asexual. I just happen to be both, and there are quite a lot of people out there who are both. Yeah, and that's why I think it's so important, the work that you do as an asexual educator and an advocate. Can you tell me about what that work looks like and how you got into it? Yeah, so I mean, there's kind of a lot of gaps to fill, so I pretty much just try my hand at everything. So initially it was just kind of like incorporating it into my modeling work and talking about it on social media. I write articles for a bunch of different platforms 
podcasts, I've done radio, I've done a radio docuseries, documentaries, consulting on TV projects. I speak a lot of, at businesses and universities. I've launched the UK's First Aid Sexual Rights Initiative. It kind of goes into a bunch of different areas research, assisting behind the scenes, conferences, events, all that kind of stuff. I just kind of got into it very much accidentally after I graduated from my degree, I was able to kind of focus on it a bit more. But initially, it was just something I mentioned on my social media, because I'd already built a platform for my modeling, and I felt like I might as well use it to fill a gap in our representation a little bit. Because I thought it was ironic to complain that there was not much Black asexual representation if I wasn't actively doing anything about it as someone with a platform. And yeah, and it just kind of snowballed from there, really. Mm-hmm. Can you tell me a little bit more about the UK asexual rights work that you've done? On April 6th, which was International Asexuality Day, which was also an occasion I co-founded, um, I launched our first asexual rights initiative. It's called the Stonewall and Yasmin Benoit Ace Project. Stonewall being one of the biggest LGBTQ rights organizations in Europe. And yeah, we're going to be producing a report into the issue of asexual discrimination in the UK, particularly in the workplace, healthcare, and in education. And we're going to be using the results of that report to hopefully influence policy and legislation to make it more inclusive. So yeah, that's kind of what it is. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about some of the rights that you are introducing or hoping for as a part of this initiative? Well, the National LGBT Survey 2018, which was one that was conducted by the government within the UK, found that like there's such a stark difference when it comes to the asexual community. Like We have the lowest life satisfaction rates. We're less likely to be out to anyone, whether it's friends, family, colleagues. We are 10% more likely to be offered or to undergo conversion therapy compared to other sexual orientations. We are more likely to have negative experiences in healthcare, which is probably something to do with that. We still pathologize this hyperactive sexual desire disorder in the international classification of diseases, which is something that was tackled in the US already with your Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. They've kind of put a clarification in there, but we don't have that in Europe or in the UK. And so... You know, we're not included in sex education. We're not protected by the Equality Act. We're not protected by hate crime laws. So there's just like a lot of gaps that would really be helped if there was specific data dedicated to it. And if there was a report that was specific to the asexual community in the UK. So we're hoping that once we have that information, we have those testimonies that we can use it as leverage to make people listen a bit more. Mm -hmm. when we talk about ace phobia and things like that. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. So you mentioned conversion therapy, and I know that is something that has really been kind of outlawed in the psychological fields here in the U.S. Have really talked about how damaging that is. Is that the same in the U.K.? Not really. It's legal, actually. There's a campaign going on right now, and as we record this, the government is currently discussing it because people have been campaigning to get it banned for a long time. And recently our government said that they would consider banning it, but not for transgender people. And they left asexual people out of it. So then there was more campaigning about that. And so today we might find out whether they'll actually do a proper ban or not. It's hard to be optimistic because they've really lingered on it for quite a while. But yeah, Mm -hmm. that is something that hasn't really been outlawed in the UK yet, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you for that. So if you feel comfortable sharing, how did you first realize that you were both asexual and aromantic? I always say that I realized when everyone else realized that they weren't. So I feel like it's kind of like early puberty when people start having sexual orientations or their sexuality becomes like directed towards other people or they become interested in romance and dating and kind of expressing that. Prior to that, everyone's pretty much asexual and aromantic. And then all of a sudden they're not. And that's when I kind of noticed that I was experiencing things in a different way, but I didn't discover the terminology until I was a teenager and I didn't really start using it until a while later. Okay. Okay. I was going to ask, like, was there a gap in between like you realizing like, oh, I feel something that may be different versus having language to describe it? Yeah. And also you don't really feel that inclined to put language on it when you're like 10. It it would be kind of weird to bother labeling your sexual orientation at that age because I kind of assumed it would kick in at some point and that I was just kind of in a transitional phase. But By the time you're like a teenager, by the time you're like 15, like people would very much be like, what is your 
deal. And I was like, I don't know. I guess you want me to have a word for this. And that was how I ended up discovering the word was mainly through people like pestering me. But I still didn't feel like it was really that useful to have because no one really believed me when I told them what I was anyway. No one knew what I was talking about. So I was like, it's not like I can really successfully come out. So what's the point in me (laughs) having the word? Mm. So when you say people didn't believe you, what do you mean? Like, what were your experiences in trying to describe your experience? Well, they just say like, oh, well, that's not what it is. You must just be well behaved or maybe, you know, it just hasn't happened for you yet. You haven't met the right person yet. Or maybe you're gay and you haven't worked it out. Or maybe there are something physically wrong with you. Maybe there's something mentally wrong with you. Maybe you're stunted. Maybe you're repressed. Maybe you're all kinds of other things other than just being asexual. Like no one really accepted the answer. So after a while, you just stop mentioning it. Mm, Got it. So as a part of your work, you talk about the difference between aesthetic attraction and sexual attraction. Can you say more about that? Yeah. I mean, to put it very simply, like I can recognize if someone has a really nice face, I just have no inclination to sit on it. So it's kind of like that. It's like, that's the difference. Mm, (laughs) I can as a visual appeal, but it doesn't... that's it. <laughs> got it. Got it. I appreciate that that <laughs> description, right? Because it's like, okay, I can see why somebody might be attractive. I'm just not attracted to them. Yeah. It's like, this is a good looking person. Like if I had to pick a face to look at, mm-hmm. that would be a preferable one. But the attraction isn't sexual. It might be attractive in the sense that I would enjoy looking at you the same way I would like a painting or something. But you know, I'm not going to lick a painting. I'm not going to lick you either. (laughs) (laughs) So what are some of the things that you think can make it difficult for somebody to recognize that they are or may be asexual? I mean, I think the main difficulties is that there isn't really a fixed criteria. It's an objective or like a subjective experience. Like it depends on how abnormal you feel, how much you feel like you're experiencing something differently is very much dependent on your circumstances and your company and your culture and, you know, what's normalized in your environment. So it's kind of dependent on that. I think if I was living in a place where no one really expressed their sexuality at all and no one really spoke about it and girls weren't expected to do anything and boys like then I probably wouldn't have noticed. It wouldn't be something that relevant, but living in a Western country where it's kind of everywhere, it becomes more obvious. So I think that can be one of the challenges because there's no fixed criteria of what is a normal amount of sexual attraction and what is an abnormal amount of sexual attraction, what isn't enough and what is too much. So it's very much just based on like your own perception and the perception of people around you. So whenever people say like, oh, how can I know? Or this person said, I'm not, this person said I am. It's like... If you feel like it's helpful to label it, label it. If you don't feel like it's helpful, don't. That's as far as it goes, really. There's no clear cut way to think about it. Right. Yeah. I mean, because the labels, it feels like, are for other people in a lot of ways, right? And really, what the labels can do, I think, for individuals is just give language to explain how you might have been feeling like and you hadn't found that language before. Yeah. I mean, it's. It's something that's supposed to help you to articulate something. Sometimes it's helpful just for yourself if you felt like you needed to feel like other people are experiencing the same thing as you. And that makes you feel better to be able to have a term just for yourself. And sometimes people don't really care for themselves and they just do it for other people. And some appreciate it for both reasons and some don't appreciate it at all. And they don't use any label. So it's all up to you. But I spent like the good 10 years not really using any of them. And I Mm. was that worked for me and using it also works for me, but I don't really mind that much either way. (laughs) Mm, Got it. Got it. More from my conversation with Yasmin after the break. AT&T Dreamin' Black wants to celebrate you, the changemakers, innovators, and visionaries uplifting their communities. If that's you, you do not want to miss the chance to power even greater possibilities. Enter the AT&T Black Future Makers Contest for a chance to win $10,000 and an AT&T 5G-enabled device. You got this. Learn more at attdreaminblack.com slash contest. Must be 18 and older. Other restrictions apply. Essence Festival of Culture, presented by Coca-Cola, returns to New Orleans June 30th to July 3rd. All your faves in one amazing weekend. Kevin Hart, Janet Jackson, Nicki Minaj, Jasmine Sullivan, New Edition, The Roots and Friends, featuring Method Man, City Girls, and more are hitting the stage. 
Plus, you know we're bringing the full Essence experience with community, culture, and connection. It's the reset you've been waiting for. Back online and live, bringing the heat with the experiences you love, including Essence Beauty Carnival, Essence Wellness House, and more. We've got the cultural something for everyone, including meet and greets, shopping, panel discussions, workshops, and performances. It's the Black Joy for us. Sponsored in part by AT&T, Ford, McDonald's, Target, and United Health Group. Don't miss the Essence Festival of Culture June 30th to July 3rd in New Orleans. Plan your trip and get your tickets now at www.essencefestival.com. Uh, hey, Dad? Cool if I change this? They may not get each other's music, but they can both get a COVID-19 booster shot. Because the CDC recommends booster shots for people 12 years and older after completion of a primary series. Schedule an appointment as soon as you are eligible. Sponsored by BioNTech and Pfizer. So you mentioned a term earlier that I'd love for you to talk a little bit more. You mentioned ace phobia. So can you tell us what that is and what that looks like? Yeah, I mean, it's you could probably guess from the word. It's kind of like homophobia, biphobia, transphobia, all the other phobias, but kind of more specific to asexuality and just kind of like negative attitudes, negative behaviors, negative stereotypes that people place on you on the basis of your sexual orientation, specifically being asexual. So that can be in the same as other instances of any kind of queer phobia. It can be someone straight up insulting you. It can be someone thinking that there's something physically or mentally wrong with you. It could be someone thinking that you're like less of a person or feeling like you're not going to be able to live a fulfilling life or treating you differently or threatening you. Or It's very much the same logic as the other ones, really, but it can manifest in very similar ways. Mm-hmm. And what does it look like to take care of yourself in light of ACE phobia? Like what kinds of mental health impact do you feel like it has had on you or can have on other people? I mean, I'm pretty thick skinned personally. Otherwise I wouldn't be able to do this job. So I feel like for me, it doesn't have that much of an impact, not because it doesn't happen, but because I tend not to care. But I think that based on the statistics I mentioned earlier, like how many asexual people just do not come out to anybody and are in fear of coming out because they're scared of what the reactions will be. It has a psychological impact of feeling like you have to live in secret or you have to make yourself do things that you don't want to do so that you can be accepted or so you can fit the box of what we're taught is how you live a fulfilling, happy, connected life with other people. And the rates of like depression and anxiety in the asexual community are as high as they are within the wider queer community, higher than it is within the heterosexual population. And I don't doubt that it is because of ace phobia and it's because of all the messages that you internalize as someone who isn't straight, that there is something wrong with you and that you won't really be happy and that no one's going to accept you and no one's going to love you and all that kind of stuff. So I think it definitely has an impact in those ways. Mm -hmm. So how would you say that the asexual community is situated in the larger queer community? It can be a topic of (laughs) debate for some people, but like for me, if you're asexual, then the chances are that you're not straight. You don't really have the experience of someone who's heterosexual. And based on my understanding of queerness, that was quite a big part of the criteria. You either don't really align with like gender expectations or you don't fit within like the heteronormative box. And therefore you are kind of part of that community. But yeah, so I mean, that's kind of how it fits. It's something that like looking back historically, like all of the early mentionings of asexuality have been by people who are within the LGBTQ plus community. It's been by gay writers, gay historians, gay sexologists. Most of like the early literature was tied in with like lesbianism and back in like the 1960s kind of, like that kind of era. And even beforehand when it came to early research, like the Kinsey scale, which was kind of looking at different sexual orientations and like the populations of it. The first documentation of asexuality was within that. So it's it's something we've always kind of been tied into it, just not in a very obvious way, just because of like the prominent messages in the community aren't always relative to us, but then can also be relative to us depending on 
the perspective. So Mm -hmm. yeah, it's a strange topic of debate, but we've always been in there. (laughs) Yeah. So can you tell me more about what's up for debate? (laughs) It's very much a kind of like mean girls, you can't sit with us kind Uh, of vibe. I mean, there is exclusionism within the LGBTQ plus community, the same way there is of any others. Like there's racism in the community. There's people that don't like bi people and then they don't like trans people. And then they only like certain types of gay people or certain types of lesbians. And then they don't think asexual people should be in there. And they don't think that pansexuality is a thing. And there's all kinds of debate going on constantly. So we just kind of get caught up in one of them of this sort of oppression Olympics mentality. And this idea that, I don't know, there's a certain amount of seats at the table and that if you are there, then you have to kick someone else off who deserved that space more than you because they faced more historical oppression than you did. And it's a very strange criteria to base things on, but that is the debate, unfortunately. Yeah. And I can imagine that this feels even more marginalizing for Black people who identify as asexual or aromantic. The strange part about being caught in that debate as someone who's Black is that so often I have white people telling me that I don't understand what oppression is and I don't understand what discrimination is and trying to educate me on these phenomenons because they can't really equate being asexual and being Black. And so they kind of have this script predetermined and and they don't know how to adjust it. So they just go straight to it as though they're talking to like a suburban white kid and they're like well you don't understand what discrimination is so that's why you're under this strange idea that you're part of a marginalized group and let me explain to you what oppression is and I'm like please white guys sit down like I know I know I'm not even equating asexuality to the oppression of being gay or the oppression of being black and obviously you don't know what the oppression of being black is like so let's not get into that subject but it's all very strange because that happens to me so often (laughs) Hmm. And do you feel like that is, I mean, I can't imagine that that is uniquely like a UK thing, but do you think it is something about like the culture in Europe that brings about that kind of a feeling? It's definitely not just Europe. I think it's America as well. Like I think a lot of my audience is American. I think it's very much the same over there. I'd say it's probably mainly a UK, US phenomenon, just because in terms of like the loudest asexual populations, it tends to be people in those countries. I think we just tend to be the loudest of Western countries in general. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's something that's definitely going on in the UK right now. There's definitely a kind of exclusionist movement happening here. Like trans exclusionary radical feminism is very much a thing here. But then you also see things like that kind of happening in the US as well. I don't know if it's, it's the same or as bad, but I feel like it's a kind of a similarity. Yeah, it definitely feels like there has been some related to like J.K. Rowling, right? Like it feels like there has been a resurgence of, you know, that kind of sentiment, more discussion around that. Yeah, she riled a lot of people up, (laughs) especially, especially here. She gave them a newfound confidence and those people do not like me and they do not like asexual people either. So we tend to get very caught up in that. Yeah. So what are some of the common misconceptions that you've come across about people who are aromantic or asexual? I mean, they're slightly different, but sort of reminiscent of the same thing. I always say that if for asexuality, it's more that there's something wrong with your body. And for aromanticism, it's more like there's something wrong with your soul because we equate experiencing romantic love as being like a huge sign of your like humanity and your capacity to connect with people. So when you say that that's actually not how my like emotions manifest for people, they think that you're like a full-blown Voldemort. So that tends to be one of the main ones that people attach it to your personality and think that you must be like a full-blown serial killer, like a total psychopathic, narcissistic person are probably the things that like I hear the most. But I've been called <laughs> a serial killer more times than I can count which is strange because you'd think that if I actually was a serial killer, people wouldn't want to piss me off. So they wouldn't say that, but (laughs) they seem to miss that important detail. And then for like asexuality, it's kind of like that you must just be like very anti-sex or frigid or prude, or you think you're too good for anybody. Like that's why you don't find anyone sexually attractive, or maybe you're too ugly for everybody and no one wants you anyway. So you're just using it as an excuse or people think that like you're an incel or that you just kind of like have a hormonal problem or you just can't become physically aroused or you're scared of sex or you have some kind of trauma is a very common one. People tend to think that you must have just been sexually abused and like it just traumatized you and now you 
don't understand sex at all or something. Or that you're like a pedophile and you're just using that as a cover is another strangely common one. (laughs) Wow. Okay. And so related to, it sounds like this is most closely related to aromantic. So can you talk a little bit about the capacity to form other relationships that are not like romantic, like parent-child or friendships? Like, can you say a little bit about that? I feel like when you're kind of aromantic, like you're... You know, people use that phrase like, oh, you're friends? Or are you like more than friends? It's like, no, like friendship is the more, like that is that is the peak. That is the epitome. Like it's not a stepping stone to something else. Like that is the kind of one of the types of relationships that I value as much as someone would value a romantic relationship. So it, when people kind of equate it with like not having an emotional capacity for people, it's like, no, it's just like there's more than one type of way you can like someone. I think it's a shame that people put all their eggs in one romantic basket and don't place that same energy in like different kinds of relationships. But like, you know, you can have great relationships with your friends. You could form families with your friends and then parents, siblings, children, (laughs) pets. You could be like a mentor to people. You could teach people. Like there are so many different kinds of relationships that you can have that can be very fulfilling. Like I know people that are teachers that don't have any kids of their own, but in a sense they have hundreds. So it's like, there's so many different ways that you can have like, you know, meaningful bonds of people that don't involve celebrating Valentine's with them. (laughs) Right, right. More from my conversation with Yasmin after the break. AT&T Dreamin' Black wants to celebrate you, the changemakers, innovators, and visionaries uplifting their communities. If that's you, you do not want to miss the chance to power even greater possibilities. Enter the AT&T Black Future Makers Contest for a chance to win $10,000 and an AT&T 5G-enabled device. You got this. Learn more at attdreaminblack.com slash contest. Must be 18 and older. Other restrictions apply. Essence Festival of Culture, presented by Coca-Cola, returns to New Orleans June 30th to July 3rd. All your faves in one amazing weekend. Kevin Hart, Janet Jackson, Nicki Minaj, Jasmine Sullivan, New Edition, The Roots and Friends, featuring Method Man, City Girls, and more are hitting the stage. Plus, you know we're bringing the full Essence experience with community, culture, and connection. It's the reset you've been waiting for. Back online and live, bringing the heat with the experiences you love, including Essence Beauty Carnival, Essence Wellness House, and more. We've got the cultural something for everyone, including meet and greets, Shopping, panel discussions, workshops, and performances. It's the Black Joy for us. Sponsored in part by AT&T, Ford, McDonald's, Target, and United Health Group. Don't miss the Essence Festival of Culture June 30th to July 3rd in New Orleans. Plan your trip and get your tickets now at www.essencefestival.com. Uh, hey dad, cool if I change this? They may not get each other's music, but they can both get a COVID-19 booster shot because the CDC recommends booster shots for people 12 years and older after completion of a primary series. Schedule an appointment as soon as you are eligible. Sponsored by BioNTech and Pfizer. So you have developed this viral campaign, the hashtag, this is what asexual looks like. Can you tell us a little bit about your inspiration for creating the hashtag? Yeah. I mean, initially it was kind of just because I was constantly told that I don't look asexual. That's kind of one of the things that people use to like debunk my orientation to me. And it wasn't because I wasn't ticking every (laughs) seemingly asexual box. It was purely just because of what I looked like. And I know that had everything to do with my race. I know it had everything to do with how I dressed and there being a sort of stereotypical image, like this kind of Sheldon Cooper or like mousy, homely white girl idea of what an asexual person is supposed to look like. And it sort of stems from the way we've been represented and just stereotypes in our culture in general, but it, very much left out like the diversity of the community, which I have seen personally, but you don't really see unless you're like looking for it and unless you're part of the community yourself. So I just wanted to give the agency back to the community so we could represent ourselves without having to rely on like the media to do it because they tended to have a very specific idea that they wanted to go for. And I also found that so much of our community, like they mainly engage with each other online. And when you are online, 
you don't really get to see people's faces very often. You're still like avatars and emojis and like blocks of text, but I don't think it's very healthy to only interact with people inside your community and never actually see what anyone looks like. So I kind of wanted to just see some more faces and now you can like type that in and scroll and see loads and loads of faces. So I've personally found that quite helpful. Yeah. And you talked earlier about incorporating some of this into your modeling work. Can you say more about that and like how you've taken on the initiative to include representation in that way with your modeling work? It was initially unintentional because I didn't really think that we still lived in a time where people would like equate your appearance to your sexuality that much. Like I didn't think that me being a model and being asexual was going to be like a controversial point until it was. And then I kind of realized that regardless of whether one thing was associated with the other, every time I put out something modeling related, people are going to see asexuality and that they're going to tie that in. And it's going to kind of inevitably become like a social statement. And so I was like, okay, well, I mean, it, it can't really be avoided. So I might as well just like own that association and, For example, I did a campaign last year with a lingerie brand called Playful Promises, and we did like an asexual themed like lingerie campaign with them, which was like both educational and aesthetically pleasing (laughs) to me anyway. I thought it looked cute. And yeah, and just using the opportunities you have, like when you're modeling, people do interviews and you get to use that as a way to like raise awareness at the same time and tying them all together. Some people find it a bit perplexing, but I think a lot of other people find it cool because it kind of strays away from that idea that if you're not sexually attracted to people, then you need to make yourself very sexually unattractive and you need to like dull yourself down and you shouldn't do your hair or do your makeup or put any effort into your clothing and you should be like a little wallflower that tries to blend into the background as much as possible. So it kind of challenges that idea, which I think some people appreciate. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing that about the Playful Promises campaign, because that seems like a very cool way for brands to kind of get involved with, you know, of course, displaying their products, but also educating. Have you found that you've been approached to do lots of those kinds of campaigns or are you pitching to brands to do more of that? I mean, that was definitely one that I sort of pitched to them. Asexuality is not very trendy. (laughs) It's not something that people like inherently think about like ah let's do something that's like focus on this I do spend a lot of time like pitching to people but then like it being pride month there's definitely been a few campaigns like I just did one for Mercedes and I did another one for a flower company called Bloom and Wild and you kind of get to make it educational while also having some cool visuals having some cool cars having some pretty flowers and some pretty outfits So it's fun getting to blend it because I think that humans are very simple and we just like to look at nice things half the time. (laughs) We're more likely to pay attention to something if there's something aesthetically pleasing at the front of it that catches your eye. So I think it's also quite a helpful technique to (laughs) get people's attention. Mm -hmm, I agree. So do you feel like there is any good representation that you've seen in the media for asexuality or aromanticism, like any movies or TV shows that you feel like have done a really good job depicting this? There's kind of two ways, because it's like, there are some which are good, but I wouldn't watch it. (laughs) There are so many things where I'm like, this is good if you're that type of person. For example, there's a character on a, a British soap, I think her name's Liv or Liz, who is an asexual white teenage girl in the countryside. And it's like, if you are an asexual white teenage girl in the countryside, then that is it for you. But I am not a white teenage girl in the countryside. Mm -hmm. I can't relate. But I'm sure like there are things like that, or there's book characters, like there's a character in Alice Osmond's book, Loveless, which is cute if you're into like young adult, teenage, high school things. I personally don't really read that kind of stuff, but I'm like, I've heard it's very good, but like, I don't really watch it. Or Todd from Bojack Horseman is probably one of the more popular examples. Again, I don't watch it, (laughs) but that is kind of one of the few examples that's like an adult white guy, I think, but like, you know, it's an adult, but yeah, they tend to just be very, I don't know, it's overwhelmingly white characters. It's just kind of one of the reasons why I'm like, it's good if you relate, I don't, but I'm also at a stage of life where I don't need it myself. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So it's kind of okay if I don't relate. I can relate to myself, so it's fine. But yeah, I feel like there's not many examples, but there's definitely like things out there, but it's not something that like personally appeals to me very much. 
<laughs> yeah. So we talk about just a general shortage of like black characters that often kind of people can relate to. And so this seems like an even larger shortage of people who maybe identify as asexual or aromantic on the screen. Things that seem sort of like asexual or aromantic coded, but it's usually like not in a good way. Like if you have a character that has no interest in romantic relationships it's probably because they're really awkward or they're like evil and those are kind of like your either high maintenance awkward or evil and those are your free like components or they're aliens or robots or something so there are kind of things out there in that sense but i don't know i don't really count that <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah So you mentioned a little earlier that it can be hard for people to even recognize Black people as asexual or aromantic. And I would imagine for Black women, this can be more complicated because it feels like there are typically all these stereotypes about like Black women and their sexuality, right? Either being Jezebels or fast or, you know, all of these things. Can you talk a little bit about that intersectionality and like what kinds of things maybe have come up and what might make it hard for Black women to be able to identify as asexual? Yeah, I mean, we're probably like one of the most hypersexualized demographics in the world. So that in itself makes it very hard for people to like equate asexuality with blackness. And I'm very sure that that was one of the reasons why people found it very hard for me to believe that I was asexual in the first place was purely on the basis of me being black and the kind of expectations that people already had on how my sexuality was supposed to manifest. I'm pretty sure that if I was like a white kid, it would not be very hard (laughs) to believe that I was asexual, but people just did not accept it at all for me. And I think coming out as asexual, almost impossible. It also kind of makes even relating to the way asexuality is represented very hard because it is very much predominantly white. The space is very white. The representation is very white. It's very much associated with whiteness still. So even once you bridge that gap and come to like your own place of self-acceptance, there isn't really that many places you can go with that because it's not a conversation that's happening in the black community at all. And it's not a conversation that you're really that included in within the asexual community either. So you're kind of just like left in your own little bubble and it can be a very strange one to navigate. Hmm. So are there any words of advice that you have for somebody who may be listening to your conversation, who might be a Black woman and struggling to figure out, am I asexual? Am I aromantic? Or maybe they've already figured it out and want to come out. Any words of advice you would share with them? The main thing I always say is just like understanding that there isn't anything wrong with you and you can live a perfectly happy, fulfilling life while being asexual and aromantic and Black. And also that like other people's reactions to you aren't a reflection of you and they aren't a reflection of your sexuality and that is a reflection of their own ignorance most of the time. And you shouldn't feel pressured to fit a certain box, I think, that there's even within the asexual community, like people feel like they kind of have to dull certain parts of themselves down to be like the palatable type of asexual person. And outside of that, people feel like, oh, we have to use a label. I have to describe it this way. And you don't actually have to do anything. Do whatever makes you feel like it's helpful for you. Do whatever makes your life easier and don't feel like you have to kind of go down like some big rabbit hole of ticking boxes or fitting into other people's ideas just to make life easier for them. You don't actually have to do that. Thank you. I appreciate you sharing that. So you've talked a couple of times about the difficulty in like finding support and finding community within this smaller community. Are there any resources besides the ones that you offer for people who may be looking for community or looking to connect with other people who share similar experiences? Are there any things that you're familiar with you want to share? In terms of finding community, that's like a quote unquote safe space. I know that there is an Instagram called Ace and Grace, which is kind of specifically like it's run by someone who's black and asexual and they share like black asexuality related stuff. I mean, there are places where like lots of asexual people like conjugate, but I've experienced racism in those same spaces. So I feel like it would be (laughs) inappropriate to recommend them. Like I I wish I could say that there was like a bunch of options, but there isn't really. Okay. So they can, can stay connected to you. And if you find anything, I'm sure you'll share it on your own platforms. Or maybe I mean, you create that, something. Yeah, I, mean, I know that, like, you know, the space, like, my own socials are sort of, like, safe space. Like, I don't tolerate any racism in mine. And sometimes people find each other through, like, the comment sections of my things and stuff. So, like, that's an option. Sometimes comment sections on things can be a great way to find people. But there isn't, like, a giant, like, 
a black inclusive forum or anything like that. And I have thought about doing one myself, but then that's like a lot of additional responsibility of like managing <laughs> a whole space and making sure everyone behaves themselves. Like, right, it's, right. It's like, it's too much. I'm not a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of that, where can we stay connected to you and your work? What's your website as well as any social media handles you'd like to share? My website is yasminbenoit.co.uk. I mean, if you just type in Yasmin Benoit on Google, I'm sure most of my social platforms will pop up. Instagram is at the Yasmin Benoit and Twitter is at the same thing. And those ones are both verified. I have a TikTok that I don't use, a YouTube that I don't use. <laughs> so those are the ones that like, they, they're mine, but I don't really use them. So yeah, Twitter and Instagram. And yeah, my website is probably the best places where you can find me. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thank you so much for sharing with us today, Yasmin. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I'm so glad Yasmin was able to share her expertise with us today. To learn more about her and her work, be sure to visit the show notes at therapyforblackgirls.com slash session 262. And be sure to text two of your girls and tell them to check out the episode right now. If you're looking for a therapist in your area, be sure to check out our therapist directory at therapyforblackgirls.com slash directory. And if you want to continue digging into this topic or just be in community with other sisters, come on over and join us in the sister circle. It's our cozy corner of the internet designed just for black women. You can join us at community.therapyforblackgirls.com. This episode was produced by Frida Lucas and Elise Ellis and editing was done by Dennis and Bradford. Thank y'all so much for joining me again this week. I look forward to continuing this conversation with you all real soon. Take good care. Right now, there are millions of people around the world hosting on Airbnb. I mean, there's no doubt it's a great way to earn extra income. I've always wondered about their stuff, though. Like, what happens if somebody drops a wine glass? Now I know. Thanks to Air Cover for Hosts, people can welcome guests into their home with confidence. Air Cover for Hosts gives you damage protection for free every time you host. Learn more and host with peace of mind at airbnb.com slash aircover for hosts. Maui Moisture Vegan Hair Care brand is the moisture expert for the diverse spectrum of curly hair from fine waves to kinky coily. Maui Moisture starts with 100% aloe vera as the first ingredient and blended with other hydrating ingredients to offer a full spectrum of moisture solutions. Maui Moisture is free from silicones, parabens, sulfated surfactants, gluten, synthetic dye, and animal byproducts. Visit tiny.cc forward slash Maui Moisture on Amazon to receive 15% off select Maui Moisture products. Ends June 26, 2022. Shingles? Oh boy, my wife did not have a good time. You mean that rash she had? Yeah, she said she'll never forget the pain, the burning, the rash lasted for weeks, and there's nothing you can do to prevent it. Well, actually, there's a vaccine that can prevent shingles. What? what? Yeah, shingles can be prevented. Shingles, shingles can, can be, be what? what? Prevent it. 50 years or older, talk to your pharmacist today about shingles vaccination. This advertisement is brought to you by GSK.